Okay, we're going to turn now to our keynote address. I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the endowment, um, and I'm, uh, I'm very honored to introduce Commissioner George Apostolakis of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, it would be um, an honor under any circumstances to have him with us. Um, it is particularly so today since his area of expertise for which he is known around the world um, is so much at the heart of, uh, of what we're discussing today, and, and that is probabilistic risk assessment. Before joining the NRC, he was a professor of nuclear engineering and uh, um, nuclear physics at MIT, um, received his Ph.D. at Caltech, my old alma mater, um, and, uh, um, and as I said, um, has pioneered quantitative modeling to assess risk to, um, uh, uh, in a way that has deeply influenced regulation of nuclear power around the world. So um, uh, he is in, a, uh, I think, a unique position to comment both on um, uh, what happened before and what has happened since both and di particularly differently in the United States and in the rest of the world. So we very much uh, thank him for taking time to be with us, and please join me in welcoming Commissioner Pastelak. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come here. I found the previous panel very, very interesting. So I'm going to uh, address some of the issues that we're facing at the NRC as a result of uh, the accident at Fukushima. Uh, the agency decided early on to follow a methodical and systematic approach to the lessons learned and uh, actions, possible actions. Uh, that decision was informed by what happened after Three Mile Island, where uh, a torrent of regulations was issued, and maybe some of them were not very well thought out. So we had inspections done at all 104 US, uh, U.S. plants. We formed the Fukushima Near Term Task Force that was charged to give us recommendations within 90 days, which they did. Uh, the recommendations from the task force uh, were given to a steering committee consisting of senior managers at the NRC who uh, reviewed the recommendations. They received input from external stakeholders, which is the standard process of the agency. And also, we received an evaluation from the statutory advisory committee on reactor safeguards and after all this was received, all this information, the steering committee submitted recommendations to the commission. And now we are taking action on what have been uh, called high priority actions. Uh, three orders that are in the public domain now uh, are about to be issued to the licensees. Uh, the first one deals with the protection of uh, mitigate, mitigation uh, strategies equipment, uh, the so-called uh, B5B equipment. The second one requires the licensees to install hardened vents in the BWR Mark I and II containments. And the third one requires reliable instrumentation for the spent fuel pools. Uh, these items were characterized as high priority. The Commission is now uh, in the process of coming up with a final uh, decision. All orders have been approved by the Commissioners. We are also issuing uh, a letter requesting information, uh, and uh, that information is related to uh, the seismic and uh, flood uh, design basis. Uh, also, the licensees will be asked to conduct walkdowns, again, looking at seismic and flood protections. And uh, the third item has to do with emergency preparedness, staffing, and communications. We are also initiating rulemaking uh, to revise the station blackout requirements. 
and uh, strengthen and integrate the emergency operating procedures with the so-called severe accident management guidelines, uh, which are a voluntary initiative at this point uh, from the industry, and the uh, so-called extensive damage mitigation guidelines. So this will be an integrated set. So this is where we are today. And before I go on and talk about these orders, I'll give you some personal views on Fukushima. And I'm glad that the previous panel addressed these in more detail. Um, I've heard people, responsible people from around the world, referring to the accident as unthinkable and are unforeseen and so on. Uh, my view is that it was not unthinkable and it was not unforeseen. Uh, as we heard uh, earlier, the tsunami hazard was underestimated. Critical equipment were located in lower plant elevations where a simple flooding risk assessment would have I told them that that was not the right thing to do. And then, uh, as we learned uh, from uh, the government of Japan report, the, uh, the management of the accident was less than optimal fundamentally because there was no single decision maker and there were two or three agencies and companies trying to manage the, the accident without anybody being clearly in charge. Well, do these negative comments mean that there is nothing to learn from the accident? Clearly not. There are lessons to be learned. However, there are a few things that we should bear in mind. Uh, for example, before we rush to modify the plant, the technology itself, the hardware, it seems to me a major me message from Fukushima is that we should make sure that the design basis of the, of the uh, plants is the correct one. And we are in the process of doing that for earthquakes and uh, floods, as I mentioned. At the same time, the accident itself created a sense of urgency on the part of the public. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, you're a commission. You have to do something and so on. Um, and that's very understandable as long as we don't find ourselves in a situation where this sense of urgency pushes us to, make, to take actions that we have not uh, scrutinized to the appropriate level and, uh, and rush into action, in other words, like happened occasionally after Three Mile Island. The, another important point is that, yes, there was an accident there, but the Commission is dealing with some issues right now as we speak that I believe are much more important than some of the lessons learned from Fukushima. And a, a good example is fire protection, where uh, the licensees now a good number of the licensees is switching to the uh, standard issued by the National Fire Protection Association, and our staff is reviewing those changes, and I believe that's a major issue. Uh, fire protection, fire has always been a major contributor to risk. So I wouldn't say that everything we learned from Fukushima is more important than this. Now, before I talk about some of the philosophical aspects or, or issues that are raised by, uh, by the current situation, I think I should say a few words about the regulatory approach. Uh, fundamental to our approach is the set of so-called design basis accidents. Uh, a, a DBA is a highly stylized, highly unlikely, but postulated accident, which the facility is designed to to withstand without exceeding various exposure guidelines that uh, are in our regulations. So, um, well, and on top of that, we have a philosophy that has evolved over the decades, which is called defense in depth. And uh, what I have there is a definition by the commission, which came very late in 1999, although people were talking about defense in depth way before then. And basically, it says that you should not rely on a single item to protect you. You have to have multiple uh, successive compensatory measures. Never rely on a single thing. Uh, this is the basic philosophy of defense in depth. 
Now, both of these, as I said, the design basis accidents are highly stylized, highly improbable. So why did we do that? Well, at the time when these things were promulgated, uh, people could not quantify the risk. The, the tools were not available to do probabilistic risk assessments. So they had to deal with very rare events without really knowing how rare they were. So the idea was to have an envelope of design basis accidents that would be very unlikely, but they would serve to, come to protect us from what became later known as unknown unknowns. In other words, yes, we are very conservative. Yes, we know that. But if anything happens in the future, we're pretty confident that we are protected against, them, against it. Now, design basis accidents, as I just said, uh, are evaluated using very conservative codes. Their, sub, uh, their components and structures and so on are subjected to surveillance, inspection, and maintenance requirements, and there are very strict uh, quality assurance requirements. However, over the years, we found that it was important to deal with some so-called beyond design basis accidents. And station blackout is one of them. Now, the treatment of those has been inconsistent. They were, the, the requirements were issued at different times. As you see here, I have three of them, station blackout, anticipated transits without scrum, and loss of large areas. And the near-term Fukushima task force referred to this system as a patchwork, that we're just finding something. We say, OK, let's do something about this without having a systematic approach like we do for design basis accidents. And there are also voluntary industry initiatives, like the severe accident management guidelines I mentioned earlier are really a, a, a voluntary initiative. Um, and also the Mark I hardened containment vents that we requested some time ago were done on a voluntary basis. Uh, voluntary can mean a lot of things. I mean, it was voluntary, but they knew that if they didn't do it, the commission would take action. So I don't know how voluntary it was, but it was voluntary. And uh, the quality requirements vary a lot from for these uh, accidents. They are very key accidents because, as of course, in Fukushima we had the station blackout and really were in the realm of uh, beyond design basis accidents. So, repeating now what the high priority actions were, there are the three orders I mentioned, mitigation strategies, reliable hardened vents, and spent fuel pool instrumentation. Now, these require the plants, the licensees, to do something to their, uh, to their plants. And in this country, we don't do that arbitrarily. There is a rule called the backfit rule that uh, acts as a buffer, so to speak, that you know, the NRC staff is not allowed to come up with some idea and say, OK, go ahead and do it. We are trying to limit that apparent arbitrariness. So what is a backfit? Well, it's obviously a modification of systems or addition of systems at the facility, changes in the procedures. And um, how can we do this now? When can we actually impose a backfit? Well, the rule says that a backfit can be imposed if, if it provides a substantial increase in protection of pub to public health and safety that is cost justified. So first, we have to consider what the benefit is. And if it's just small, now again, these are subjective judgments, but if they're small, we don't even do the cost benefit analysis. But if we decide that the benefit is significant, then we go to the uh, quantitative evaluation of costs. And as usual, quantifying the benefits is really very difficult. So it's more of a judgment issue. Now, we don't have to do that if it's an issue of compliance with existing regulations. 
if it's necessary for adequate protection, and I will talk about it in a moment, uh, or if the new uh, requirement, according to the Commission's judgment, is needed to redefine adequate protection. And finally, the Commission may say, forget about all these things. This is too important. We are not going to follow our own rule, and we are exempting ourselves from it. One thing that impressed me when I read all these things is the tremendous power the Commission has in these things. Uh, and sometimes that's part of the problem. Now, what is adequate protection? Well, adequate protection is what the Commission says it is. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, it's not defined anywhere. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, if you satisfy all the requirements for adequate protection, there is no risk. And uh, again, the Commission is charged by law to decide what adequate protection is. Tremendous power. Then, in addition to adequate protection, we can require things in the name of safety enhancement. The Court of Appeals, uh, in a case back in the 80s, uh, declared that if it so desires, the Commission can impose, may impose safety measures on licensees that go beyond adequate protection. And the exercise of this authority is entirely discretionary. And when the Commission determines whether and to what extent to exercise this power, it may consider economic costs. Costs do not play any role when we deal with adequate protection. But when we go beyond adequate protection and we declare a new requirement as being necessary for enhancing safety, then cost should play a role. And as I told you, in the backfit rule, yes, uh, you have to do, go through a cost-benefit analysis. By the way, a lot of people, including me, are very unhappy with the methods for, uh, that, that we're using right now to do the cost-benefit analysis. And uh, the commission, I mean, the staff is now looking at it again, trying to update the methodology, and I, I, I think that's a good thing to do. Now, this, all, all this had to do with, um, well, let's stay here for a while. Um, the, the three orders that I mentioned, what does it mean now in, in, the, in this context? Well, let's look at them again. They were somewhere here. The five commissioners have voted. The votes are public, so I can talk about them. But the, the commission decision is in the process of being formulated, so I cannot talk about it. But the five votes are out there. The protection of mitigation strategies and the reliable hardened vents. I, the majority of the commissioners voted to justify these orders in the name of adequate protection. Again, let's, let me make it very clear. All the commissioners voted to send out these orders. So the licensees will have to comply. There is no question about it. Now, within the commission, though, there is disagreement as to what the justification for the orders is. And the justification does not affect the licensees. The licensees have to do it. Very clear, because there were some reports recently that showed that that was not understood. So these three things they must do. Now, we have to justify among ourselves why. So the first two will be issued in the name of ensuring adequate protection. We are not redefining it. We are saying that we have adequate protection now, as we had a year ago. However, these things are needed to make sure that we maintain it. The last one, adding instrumentation, uh, some commissioners felt it should also be issued in the name of adequate protection. Uh, by the way, one commissioner felt that none of these should be issued in the name of adequate protection. So there is some disagreement. 
But it seems to me that the majority for the spent fuel pool instrumentation uh, argues that uh, they should be issued as exemptions, administrative exemptions from the backfit rule. In other words, we don't want to go through cost-benefit analysis. The commissioners decided that it's, there is significant safety benefit, and we don't want to, to do the cost-benefit analysis. This is a, something, of course, that should not be used frequently, as the redefinition of adequate protection should not be used frequently. So this is where we stand now. It, so I, I repeat, these justifications and arguments do not affect with the li what the licensees are supposed to do. They're supposed to comply with the orders. Now, after all this uh, regulatory structure was put in place back in the late 60s, early 70s, probabilistic risk assessment came along in the mid-70s. Um, and when people say probabilistic risk assessment, they tend to put a lot of emphasis on the probabilistic. Well, that's an important aspect of it, but in my view, one of the great benefits of doing a probabilistic risk assessment is answering the first question I have there, what can go wrong in the facility? Which means developing accident sequences, accident scenarios, regardless of probability. With, and this is very different from the traditional approach of design basis accidents. You see, in the traditional approach, which is still in place, by the way, there is a number of uh, 15 or so design basis accidents. That's all we do. And then we hope that we, div we have this envelope that I mentioned, so anything, that, anything that may happen in the future is under this envelope. We don't develop accident sequences. We just postulate design basis accidents. PRA comes along and says, now let's look at the whole plant and look at possible accidents. And with modern computers now, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of scenarios that are being developed in a modern risk assessment. Very different approach from the design basis accidents. But then, of course, if you develop, say, 500,000 scenarios, doesn't, that does not really help you much in managing the risk from the plant. So the second question then comes along that says, how likely, asks how likely are these scenarios, and uh, the frequencies of these scenarios are developed with uncertainties. The point is, though, that we can use these frequencies to rank these accident scenarios, and one uh, very impressive result from the PRAs around the world is that the risk in nuclear power plants is typically dominated by less than 20 sequences. It's inc an incredible result if you think about the hundreds of, if not millions, of uh, sequences that are developed. But the majority of the risk comes from sequences that are less than 20 in number. And, of course, the consequences at the end. The consequence, you can look at the health consequences. You can look at the release of radioactivity or even core damage. So this is a fundamentally different philosophical approach of risk assessment. It's a really a, systemic, a systems approach. Now, as a side remark, in the uh, early 80s, a lot of groups asked the commission, you know, okay, you're doing the PRAs, you find these probabilities, what are you going to do with them? How do you know what is acceptable or not? And that's when the quantitative health objectives were issued that basically said that uh, the risks from uh, nuclear power plants should not exceed 0.1% of the one-tenth of 1% of the background accident or cancer mortality risk, which is about 5, 10 to the minus 7 and 2, 10 to the minus 6. So this means if you look at the 2 times 10 to the minus 6 per year, if you multiply that by 1,000, you get 2 in 1,000, which is the rough estimate of cancer mortalities in the United States at this point. So we take the average estimate, two in a thousand, divided by a thousand, and we say this is the goal for a nuclear plant. 
And we also have so-called subsidiary goals. We don't want core damage events to occur more frequently than once every 10,000 years and releases of radioactivity once every 100,000 years. Now, unfortunately, it was, as it was pointed out earlier, people don't care about the fact that maybe core damage uh, events occur once every 17,000 reactor years. What they care about is that there was one in the 70s, another in the 80s, and another one now. So somehow it seems to me we have to address that issue. Uh, but my point of showing this is also to tell you that with probabilistic risk assessments, now we can have metrics for reactor safety, for risk. Whereas with the traditional approach of design basis accidents, it's all judgment. Now, the Fukushima near-term task force, the NRC's task force, had a series of 12 recommendations, but the recommendation number one was very interesting. It said that, as I said earlier, these beyond design basis accidents and regulations have been promulgated uh, at different times with different uh, goals and so on, and they talked about a patchwork of regulations. So they recommended that the Commission establish a logical, systematic, and coherent regulatory framework for adequate protection that appropriately balances defense in depth and risk considerations. Even though we are using risk considerations here and there to make decisions, there, such a system right now does not exist. It's fundamentally the traditional design basis, accidents based system. Uh, we asked the, uh, the staff, because this is really a, a big deal, we asked the staff to come back with a proposal in early 2013 to tell us how this could be achieved, okay? Because the staff is too busy now with the other stuff that I showed you, like uh, spent fuel pool instrumentation and so on, things that should be done immediately. And then we like task forces, I suppose. So there is another task force called the Risk Management Task Force that uh, was formed when uh, Chairman Yatsko approached me in late uh, 2010 to head such a task force to um, assess options for a more holistic risk-informed performance-based regulatory system. Uh, this task force was formed before Fukushima, it officially be, uh, came to existence in February of 2011, and of course, Fukushima occurred about a month later. And the charter is to develop a strategic vision where the NRC wants to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. The final report is being prepared as we speak. It should come out in a month. But I will give you just one piece that we are proposing that is relevant to Fukushima. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the, the problem the Commission had with the recommendations and the orders. Is it adequate protection or is it beyond design basis? Okay? We are pro so the dilemma is always, should we do this in the name of adequate protection or safety enhancement? It seems to me that this question would be diminished in, in importance if we introduce the third category, which we call design enhancement category. A lot of people have talked about it in the Western European uh, Regulatory Association has talked about a design extension category. But we are proposing that the NRC should formally establish such a category. So there will be now three categories, adequate protection, design enhancement, and beyond design enhancement. Uh, in this category, though, what, what accidents be should belong to this category? Well, we can use risk metrics to make these decisions. There should be some consideration of costs. In other words, if you are in there, show us that you did a cost-benefit analysis that shows that maybe you shouldn't do anything or there are things that you can do to reduce the frequency of, of this category. So here is what uh, the... As I said, now we only have adequate protection category and everything else. 
In this new scheme, there would be the adequate protection category, the proposed design enhancement category, and then the residual risk category. Remember, risk can never go to zero. So, um, and I have the design basis events, for example, and if the commission decides that a new rule is an adequate protection rule, they will go to the first box. Uh, the current, the, the existing rules like uh, uh, station blackout, for example, would automatically go to the design enhancement category. And then depending on the criteria the NRC staff would be using, there may be many other sequences that belong. Uh, this, of course, assumes that you have a good PRA for the plant. Uh, they would go to the design enhancement category and then everything else would fall into the residual risk category. And uh, what have I done today? Well, uh, I told you that uh, the Commission is dealing with the highest priority recommendations from the near-term task force. We are about ready to issue the three orders that I mentioned and the request for information. Um, the staff will come in the July-August uh, time frame to the Commission with a plan uh, for the remaining actions of the task force. Uh, I discussed the philosophical, if you will, uh, issues that the orders raise, are they adequate protection, are they exemptions, and so on. And uh, I touched on the need to update the regulatory structure according to recommendation one of the near-term task force. And maybe this is a good time now to get questions, take questions. Do you want to take questions yourself? Yeah, sure. Whatever. I, the gentleman here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, George Dragnich with uh, Northcourt, which is a new global uh, nuclear insurance company based out of Lloyd's of London. Uh, Commissioner Apostologos, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. In January, the commission took a major step towards new build in the United States by approving the Westinghouse AP1000 plant and the Southern uh, Utility Company yes. in Georgia. All of the commissioners, save one, voted for that. The sole person not voting for it was the chairman of the commission, who told the press that he could not vote for a decision of that sort that did not make explicit reference to Fukushima. Now, I've just heard you, sir, uh, give us your thoughts on, on Fukushima. And so even though that is not explicit in the Southern decision, clearly commissioners would have been thinking about Fukushima while they were making this decision. In your PowerPoint, sir, you had my view, so you clearly are prepared to give your views independent of the commission as the whole. Could you share with us how you thought out the, this landmark decision on the, uh, on the Southern uh, Utility Company with Fukushima at the back of your mind? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I, it was not a case where the chairman felt that uh, the lessons learned should be applied to uh, Vogel, and the other four commissions felt that they should not. No, everybody, all five of us, agree that they should apply. The difference of opinion was in the mechanism. And the four of us felt that we already have regulatory processes in place, like the orders I just mentioned. In fact, these orders, if you go and read them, they say they apply to existing licenses, and holders of COLs, combined licenses, which means, in this case, Vogel. So the chairman wanted a condition on the Vogel license that said you will apply whatever the commission decides later. The four of us felt that that was not necessary, that we would force them to comply with the individual order. So it was a difference of opinion regarding the mechanism. But we didn't disagree on the fact that they should do it. Okay. Right behind Mark there. I can't see the face, so. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Dolly with Platts. Uh, Commissioner, last month uh, the chairman uh, gave a speech uh, 
on risk-informed regulation in which he postulated, and uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but under some views of risk-informed regulation, uh, the Fukushima accident might have been calculated to be acceptable because there were no prompt fatalities and are likely to be very few uh, uh, latent cancer fatalities. Uh, I expect this is not necessarily the view of risk-informed regulation that some others have. Could, could you share your perspective on w whether or not there's a potential for too much tunnel vision in uh, yeah. risk assessments along the lines that the chairman laid out? Yeah, I, um, I show the quantitative health objectives, okay? If you, oh, okay, that's okay. If you go to, uh, if you go, um, look at Fukushima, there were no deaths uh, due to radiation, and the estimates from experts of uh, latent cancers is that the, the rate will be very low. So in that sense, the quantitative health objectives of the commission were met. But the, we would be kidding ourselves if we said everything is fine and our ob health objectives have been met, because obviously there is land contamination, the people had to be evacuated, and so on. And I don't know when they're going to be allowed to come back. But the safety objectives of the commission do not include this kind of thing. And I think that's what the chairman really was talking about, that maybe we ought to be thinking about it. But coming back to the point that you made, the risk results would not be used just to show compliance <coughs> with the objectives. In fact, I have seen some uh, preliminary estimates of the frequency of the accident in Fukushima. And the lowest I have seen that it was, it was about once every thousand years. There was another estimate once every 300 years. Now you might say once every thousand years is, a, whoa, that's a rare event. In the nuclear safety arena, it is not. It is absolutely not. It would be intolerable. If we had that in the United States, we would act immediately. And there is, in fact, precedent. There was a plant in the States, maybe 20 years ago, where some engineer made a mistake and came out with a frequency of core damage of about uh, eight or nine per thousand years due to fires. And it's very interesting to me that the utility itself shut down the plant immediately and the NRC sent a group of people to go and find out what happened. So any numbers approaching one in a thousand or greater are simply intolerable in the States. It's not a, whether you meet the goals or not. So that's another piece of evidence that shows that what happened in Fukushima, if we had done risk assessments here and we had identified it, would never have been allowed to operate the plant. The plant would never be allowed to operate. Franklin Yao uh, with the GAO. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the third order, which is on spent nuclear fuel pool um, yeah. instrumentation, what the thought process was behind it, um, and the timing it might be on it? Um, um, we've heard some people suggest that uh, the spent nuclear fuel pools were not really a major problem in Fukushima, that there may have been a hydrogen explosion, but not necessarily risk of a zirconium fire. So I'm just interested in what the commission is sort of thinking with respect to this third order. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the argument is that we receive from the staff why we have why this is important is that there was a period of time during the accident in Fukushima where the authorities were, did not know whether the water in the spent fuel pools had uh, been removed one way or another. In other words, whether the spent fuel rods were exposed to the atmosphere. And that distracted them, that they spent time trying to figure that out without focusing on the managing the accident itself. So this was the main recommendation why we should do this. Add extra instrumentation that will give us the actual water level in the pool. Right now we have instrumentation that gives us you know, the desired level and maybe small deviations from it, but not what happens throughout the pool. 
At the same time, we have other experts who are arguing that uh, this should not have been a high priority item. The spent fuel pools do not contribute significantly to the risk from the plant. So to, we should do something about it, but not as a high priority action. Well, we had to do something. The staff sided with the side that said uh, it's important to do it, so it came to us and we approved it. Yeah. Over here. Thank you, Commissioner Apostolakis. Uh, my name is Ellen Vanko with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And um, one of the things we heard in the earlier presentation was the fact that Japan failed to consider an event that you know, had a, a thousand year probability, but wasn't properly accounted for in the design and siting of the plant. Um, but I, I want to turn that around and, and look at the siting of future nuclear power plants in this country and uh, get your opinion on how you will tie uh, climate models that are constantly evolving and predicting different uh, and more significant increases in the level of uh, the sea level as well as the intensity of storms and the location of, of natural disasters in this country that aren't part of any model to the extent they haven't occurred yet? I believe that uh, I, I remember I was on the advisory committee before I became a commissioner and I remember when we were looking at uh, some of the new applications uh, there was the discussion of how to bring those things into the licensing process. And uh, some thought was given to that, but I'm not sure that that would be what you would expect. Because uh, the, these changes are on a time scale that perhaps has, is much longer than the life of a plant. But again, I don't want to say that we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but in my view, there are other things that are much more important, like uh, the safety culture of the facilities. If you look at the failures that we have seen over the last 40, 50 years, it's really the culture. It's not the technology. The technology has never failed us. Never. It's always people. And unfortunately, that part is not in the PRAs. Culture is not in the PRAs. So... We are paying more attention to it now and so on, but if there is one thing that worries me, it's that. But climate change, I, I, I must say I haven't really focused too much on it, but I know that we, it has been discussed. Commissioner, if, if I may just add a, take a, uh, up on that last question. You described a, a highly technical, highly quantitative, enormously rigorous um, uh, process um, that when the vote came on why are we doing this, the justification for actions, people who had agreed on the vote disagreed on the reason, which I think suggests that behind this enormous layer of mathematics uh, and engineering sits, devolves down to a highly political subjective Judgment and political in the sense of, in a good sense, not in the sense of the, what's going out there today, um, uh, of, of what is adequate, mm -hmm. right? um, that can only be a human um, a, a judgment. And I just wondered, and and your comments, which were in the back of my mind too, because I I was in the White House during Three Mile Island, and I remember the um, uh, the. So clearly, the results of all the look after that, which was people, 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 that was the um, uh, bottom line. How do you, especially or perhaps in light of this um, event in Japan, how do you make those two things lie more comfortably together than they do? This the the, the enormous quantitative technical procedural uh, set of rules on which you must act and overhear this very vague subjective judgment that is enormously dependent uh, on the next accident or the next event, um, a public, a, a vague public sense of what 
uh, of how it feels about nuclear power that has n nothing to do with the hardening of some vents. Um, well, the way I see it, the, the, the first part, that the quantitative part, should really inform the judgment. And uh, the, the, the risk is that people who make the decisions may rely too much on the quantitative aspects, on the quantitative calculations. And it's very important because fundamentally here we're re uh, dealing with very rare events. We're not dealing with events that we have statistical experience with. Necessarily, this mathematical construct involves judgment as well. I mean, there are engineers who decide, yeah, the operators will do this with a certain probability. And all that stuff is buried in the analysis. The decision makers rarely see those assumptions. But there are major assumptions. As I said, for example, the decision maker should be aware of the fact that the quantitative analysis does not include culture. And then it's up to them to decide how much weight to give. There, there are no, uh, and that's why there are five commissioners. And there is no single administrator, for example. You want five persons to think about it and use their judgments and values and weigh the pros and cons and make a decision. I don't see how else it can be done. Ultimately, it's a matter of voting. <laughs> but the important thing is not to rely on quantitative analysis 100%. That's very key. All right, we'll, we'll do, take two up here. Uh, Commissioner, in one of your slides, you, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, design enhancement uh, category, yeah. you talked about uh, uh, factors uh, related to risk uh, to include performance-based uh, analysis of some sort. I, I wasn't clear about that. Per could you perhaps uh, expand on that a little bit? Is that the slide that, said, that talked about this category? I believe so, yes. Yeah. It talked about uh, it? risk as, uh, as the safety uh, uh, the, This category should use risk as a safety measure, yeah. be performance-based, include consideration of cost, and be implemented on a site-specific basis. Uh, yeah, uh, risk as a safety metric. Uh, yeah, this is it. What... what sequences should be candidates to go into that category. There are... An, there is a, performance as, as sequence. Yeah, the sequences, the accident sequences have a frequency. So there are many ways of doing this. One way, for example, would be to say, look, the initiator, all the initiators that have a frequency greater than one in 100,000 years, all these sequences are candidates. So you look at them, and then you decide whether you should do a is it cost effective to reduce that frequency? That's what we mean there. Performance based means the regulator should not get into the details of the management of the sequence and prescribe what should be done the way we used to do it in back in the 70s. But if, for example, they can show us that uh, the availability of certain equipment is uh, at a certain level, that's good enough for us. So that's what performance based means. And costs should be, uh, and also should be implemented on a site-specific basis. That's very important because I really don't need to worry about tsunamis for uh, Palo Verde, which is in the middle of a desert. Maybe I should worry about them for coastal plants, but even then there are other considerations. So that's what it meant. Right here. So, like think of your talk, you have alluded to the fact that uh, Can you, would some... You just Somehow, uh, introduce yourself. Thanks. Marco Di Capo and NSA. Uh, you, should in, you alluded somewhat to the fact that while there was no loss of life at Fukushima, the economic costs were enormous. To what degree is, and in the regulatory process, it seems like the health issues are the ones that are paramount. Is there any plans to actually consider economic issues in, in, in terms of the regulatory approach in case of an accident? No. There are no such plans right now. Individuals talk about it, like the chairman did some time ago, like I do every now and then, but no plans. No, there is nothing official at this point. There's one more question we could take here. 
And it, you can actually make the case that it's the licensees that should worry about it, not the commission. But because they are the ones who really well, I, I guess lose all this, all this. Yes. I was just going to continue on this. I had the same question, yeah. but I, I want to probe it a little more. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, a, a site like the Indian Point reactors that are, you know, 25 miles from 17 million people, how can you disregard the economic costs? I mean, even if, even if you were, if the evacuation plan were to attain its goals and therefore keep the, your, your dose attainment where you want it, uh, in terms of regulations, as a regulator, why would you want to ignore the contamination of the center of the uh, global economy? I mean, the potential loss of Manhattan as a resource, we're talking a trillion dollar loss. So I'm not sure how, going forward from Fukushima, we can exclude those kinds of considerations. Uh, I believe I should be silent on Indian point. None? <laughs> yes, she says. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you mentioned Indian point. That shuts me up. Look, okay. If I might, let me go back to... Um, <laughs> Rephrase it without... No, no, I, I'm asking... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm more, I guess, rephrasing my original question. Um, 53 out of 55, as I understand, nuclear power plants in Japan are now shut down, and, and in the next month or two, 55 yeah. out of 55 will be shut down. Not because of any... Um, Public. Uh, Anything about performance, anything about design, anything about anything except that the governors of the prefectures, once they're shut down, are not prepared to turn them on again. Yes. Um, uh, that goes back to my sense that somehow we have a technology that on the one hand requires an extraordinary level of technical management um, and requires the very best of um, uh, that a very highly developed society can offer, and on the other hand, makes judgments, um, I suppose one has to say, based on fear. Um, and and, and, um, uh, and I, I guess as I was listening to you, I wondered, you know, if I were sitting in a regulator's chair, how I would make those things go together, and obviously the yeah. question of economic loss in I, a general sense, is is, um, uh, is right at the heart of this. I think you're right. I, I, the issue of public perceptions versus te technical analysis keeps coming up. Yeah. And it's easy to say, you know, I'm a scientist, I will go with the technical results. You can't do that. Because, after all, you know, we're a federal agency. <laughs> We exist because the people want us to exist. Uh, it's a very difficult issue, extremely difficult. We had it uh, just recently with the leaks of uh, uh, radioactive water from buried pipes. Our technical staff did several studies and always said there is no public health and safety issue, period. There isn't. The representatives of the people were up in arms. You know, you commissioners are do not doing anything, and uh, you're endangering the public. So there is this conflict. And you try to explain that the staff says this, but that's not satisfactory. And then the licensees decided to take some voluntary initiatives again, and we're waiting now. But the question is, should we really get involved as a commission in issues that really do not threaten public health and safety. Because the charge from Congress is to do that. At the same time, many times you have people, and the Fukushima now is, is another example. You're not acting quickly enough. You're endangering the American public. Shouldn't you be doing it faster than you are doing it? And at the same time, our task force says there is no imminent risk to nu nuclear plants in the States. A lot of people now are saying what the previous panel said, that what happened in Japan is really the result not of the failures of the technology, but of the people. 
So you always have that conflict, and I don't think there is a resolution. I mean, if you say, I will only go... I mean, the noble thing to say would be, I will only go with technical analysis. Well, in real life, you can't do that. You really have to yield every now and then. All right. I um, uh, Before we uh, leave, I just want to announce that uh, we have a 15-minute break, coffee and refreshments in the hallway, and then the next panel will begin at 11.45 sharp. Please join me in, in thanking Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much.